what happened to LaShawn McCoy and the Eagles? Is Tom Brady no longer fantasy relevant? We've got our waiver wire rankings, our buy low and sell high candidates, and we'll answer your questions here on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. My name is Nick, also known as Clickwood, and I am joined, as always, by my partner in crime, Dustin, or Project KSL. And Dustin, I know our first topic is one that is close to your heart, and that is <laughs> what happened to the New England Patriots on Monday Night Football to your beloved Kansas City Chiefs? Oh, yeah. What happened? They're just a train wreck. I mean, I, I I was leading the bandwagon at the beginning of the year that was saying Tom Brady was washed as shit. You were true. Yeah, true. no, I was saying the whole offseason, I'm like, dude, no, dude, Tom Brady just is not good anymore. It's not a matter of weapons. It's not a matter of offensive line. He's just not good. He's dead last in the NFL in terms of off-target passes right now, the absolute worst. He's second in the NFL to passes over five yards being com- or in terms of uh, passes completed past five yards, that are worst to only EJ Manuel. <laughs> that's just, that's a good stat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, he doesn't throw past five yards. When he does, he's the he's the second worst in the entire league throwing past five yards. Yikes, Dead last knock target passes. He's just dreadful. He's not good. And I don't like the I don't like the the argument that says he doesn't have receivers. I don't like the argument he doesn't have ta- tackles. I mean, two years ago, they people were saying Nate Solder and Sebastian Vollmer were the best bookends in football, and now they're just terrible all of a sudden. Julian Edelman's a, a very good slot receiver. I think Shane Vereen's still a competent receiving back. Gronk isn't all the way back, but. You look at that and you look at the skill position sets on teams like the Browns and teams like the Jets and uh, the Rams. I mean, he, they're way better than that. Tom Brady's just not good anymore. and People need to accept that fact. Yeah, it's it's getting to look that way, man. Um, you know, I'm always going to have that soft spot, spot for uh, old Tommy, Tommy Smiles in my heart. But mm-hmm. at, the, at the same time, though, you have to look at it. And I agreed with you going into the year. Tom Brady was not one of my quarterbacks that I was drafting in fantasy. Um, I, I don't even think he cracked my top 12 at the position. Yep. So, I mean, to me, I was looking at guys like Jay Cutler and Tony yeah, Romo Matt and Matt Ryan and yeah. all those guys. And I had, I, I want them more than a guy like Tom Brady, just because I felt that the upside was higher. And, and so far, all of those guys have outperformed him. Romo struggled for the first three weeks of the year, but man, he's looking a lot better this past Flacco game. Too. Yeah. And Flacco too. That's another one. Ben and but even ben, ben Roethlisberger. Yeah, yeah. We're on the same page on all these, but um, <laughs> you know, all these guys I think have a higher potential than Brady going forward, unfortunately. Yep. And uh, you know, Andy it, it, the, the fact that Brady has looked so bad overall has, has really dropped the whole offense's value. Even guys like a Rob Gronkowski don't have as high of a value right now as they would have coming into the year. No, or exactly. a Julian Edelman, I still think for the most part keeps roughly his same value just because he was going so late to begin with. Yeah, he was um, going criminally late in a lot of right. drafts. So for PPR anyway, for your standard oh, yeah, scoring absolutely. league, he's I mean he's a borderline RB three for a standard league. For a, right. for a a PPR league though, I think he's an every week starter at least as a wide receiver three flex. Pro- Possibly as a wide receiver, too, depending on your situation. But Yeah, I mean, um, there's, he, there's no matter what. As bad as Tom Brady is, he still just throws to Julian Edelman like crazy. So it, I don't think his value changed, especially in PPR. He's still a threat to catch 10 balls a game easily. So let me ask you this. Based on the fact that we've seen New England do this kind of thing in the past where they'll make a very brash decision, such as trading off an offensive lineman before the yeah, season, for, like for, a week before Tim the Wright. season starts, for, for Tim, Tim Wright, Wright who's done absolutely Hernandez. nothing. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean— Mankins, I mean, it's not like he's tearing it up or anything, but I mean, still, we you look at those situations and you see that the Patriots make these crazy decisions. I mean, do you think it's possible that we're going to see them make a move for a wide receiver? I mean, maybe somebody like a, an Andre Johnson type who is, you know, said he's frustrated in Houston. Do you think that that's a potential move that the Patriots might consider doing? I, I could see them making a move for a guy that would would stretch the field. You know, because at least not have the offense so condensed. But I don't think it'll right. really. I, I I don't think it'll be a big name. I think if it is a guy, it'll be a guy like say Denarius Moore from Oakland. I could see that trade kind of going through. I know, I know, but it it'll at least stretch the field. I He's guess. got wheels. I I don't see a big name trade going there at all. I just don't. And I also think that 
even if they get a guy, I don't think Brady's good. I don't think it's the weapons. I think that he's just not good. I mean, you see those throws last yeah. night. And it's just like, dude, like, uh, Julian Edelman didn't run his route. He threw into three Chiefs regardless. It was a fucking right. horseshit decision no matter where he runs. Like, right. I don't think it matters. I, I could see them maybe. And, and the Mankins trade was such a disaster anyways. Just because, right. I mean, I get Mankins wasn't that great at pass protection last year, but he was still an elite run blocker. Right, and their running nothing. game looks real bad. Yeah, and you give them for nothing. They got, like, what, a fourth or a fifth in Tim Wright? I mean, it's just nothing. Right. You don't move a guy like that. I agreed. I mean, obviously, when they made the trade, I was like, what the hell? Like, yeah. And, and I think there was a lot of hype for Tim Wright, which oh, I think at ton. this point, come on. There was like, a ton of hype. Yeah. Was... If, if he's owned in your fantasy league, you need to ridicule the owner who owns him because, yeah, the, okay. come on. The only way that he has any value whatsoever is if Gronkowski gets hurt. And even, and then, even then, I don't think he's worth owning. Good. Yeah, even then, he's still so, a bottom tier tight end. So. Right. So we, we move from one train wreck offense to another. And this one came kind of out of nowhere. What the hell happened to the Philadelphia Eagles this week? Yeah. I mean, did they? I don't think they scored an offensive point. No, I think zero. they scored three defensive special teams yeah. touchdowns. Somehow that their defensive unit, which has just looked god awful, kept them in that game. I, I have no the words for teams. it. Yeah. I mean, Lashawn McCoy for the second straight week dropped dud. a complete dud on his fantasy yeah. owners. I mean, the guy went number one overall in a lot of leagues. I took him number one overall in a league. Yeah, he's my number one overall uh, player. What do we what do we do? I mean, do we look at this situation at this point and we are we saying that NFL defenses are starting to figure out this Chip Kelly offense? I mean, are we expecting LaShawn McCoy to improve from here? I mean, obviously he's going to improve somewhat, but right. does he remain a top 5 player going forward? Yeah, I think so. The, the thing is is that it, I've always thought about the Philadelphia offenses as fun as it is to watch and all the tempo and all the pace that they always preach. If they run into a physical defense, man, they're going to get their ass handed to them because they're just mm -hmm. not a physical team at all. They are the most True. finesse team in the league, and it's not even close. And the 49ers were on their game that day. They played super, super sound defense the whole game. They made full straight up beat him with hard throws, and he wasn't able to do it. So I, I think that event, they're not going to face the 49ers every week. They're not going to face the Seahawks every week. They're going to get some soft matchups, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I still think LaShawn McCoy is going to have – at least a, a decent to good year. I'm not panicking on LaShawn McCoy. And I think the Eagles offense is still going to be fine too for fantasy for the most part going forward. They're not going to play an elite defense every single week. One thing that I did notice is that even in a game when the Eagles got absolutely trounced and cr really couldn't move the ball, Jeremy Macklin still produced decent numbers. Yeah, Macklin's I mean, a stud. Nothing spectacular, but I mean, to me, at this point, Jeremy Macklin's proven himself. Uh, I mean, I, I, I always said years ago that I thought he was a better receiver than Deshaun Jackson. Oh, all around. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and in this offense, I feel like he is going to continue to produce as a, a low-end wide receiver one going forward. I yeah. really do believe that. Somewhere between like, you know, 12 to 15 at wide receiver I, I, is where I think Jeremy Macklin finishes, and that's excellent. I think he's going to uh, finish top 10. I really do. I think he finishes he like 10 in PPR. Right around he, their 10, 9, He 10. definitely could. Uh, it, I mean, it, of course, it's going to depend on how, how consistent he is at getting into the end zone, which he's done so far fairly well. Uh, I mean, didn't score this week. Guy. but I mean, he's full of his absolute go-to guy. It's, it's mm -hmm. crazy been established so far. So, so I mean... Nick Foles, are we worried at at all about him? Or, I mean, you, you think, obviously, that they've played a couple of tough defenses in a row. But, I mean, is it is it a situation where you look at Nick Foles and, I mean, are you buying low on him right now considering he's coming off of what will probably be the worst game that he has all year with all those interceptions and no touchdowns? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I was never I – I never had Nick Foles in my top five quarterbacks or anything like yeah, that. I never sure. thought he was near that. So, I, I mean, no, I all quarterbacks have bad games. Stafford's had some bad games so far. True. You know, I mean, everybody Aaron but Rogers Peyton had bad games. Yeah, everyone except for <laughs> and, Peyton Manning. And luck. Yeah, and luck. And Drew Brees to some extent too. He just hasn't hit what he's really wanted him to hit. Yet, but, true. True. But I, no, I'm still. If if I was comfortable taking Foles, where I was comfortable taking him on day one when we were drafting, I I still have the same opinion of him. I think yeah. he'll be fine. The Philadelphia offense is going to score enough points. The only mild concern is for LeSean McCoy because the offensive line's so banged up right now that they are just not giving him any lanes. And frankly, just explosively wise, he doesn't look like the same player that he did last year. Very, very true. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know where I rank him necessarily going forward, but you know, if we're doing a redraft, I'm probably still taking him at the end of the first round. Yeah. Uh, just He's based on the potential. Not going number one overall anymore though. 
Right, right, right. So let's move on to uh, a guy that we just talked a little bit about, and that was Andrew Luck. Yeah. So as of right now, and I know quite a few teams had their bye week this week, including Peyton Manning, who was yeah. the number one quarterback. But Andrew Luck surpassed everybody and is now the number one overall scoring player in fantasy football, quarterbacks, whatever position you want to look at, number one sure. overall player. Andrew Luck, man. I mean, we had this guy, both of us, in our top five going into the year. Where do you think you rank him at quarterback going forward from here? Because I have him all the way up at number two going forward, just yeah. behind Peyton. No, that's mine too. I have him number two overall behind Peyton. Bree, or I still have Breeze three, I think. And But to, to get to your point, yeah, Andrew Lux looked amazing. He's on pace for crazy numbers. I think he's on pace for like 52 touchdowns and 5,000 yards or something crazy like yeah. that. He's not going to hit that. that that's no, never no, of happen. course. But he... I certainly think he's going to he's an absolute lock to finish top five. I think he, there's a very good shot he finishes top three among quarterbacks the way they're throwing the ball. And just the way that, I mean, Trent Richardson is still just completely incompetent. I don't think they're ever going to get to a point where Ahmad Bradshaw's seen 30 carries a game or anything. And I, I, I think he's an absolute stud going forward. It, like you said, he's right behind Peyton Manning for me, number two if we're redrafting. And the beautiful thing about him that a lot of the other elite quarterbacks don't have is that he does have that added mobility factor. Yeah, he's he a guy can that can TDs. rush. He's a guy who can rush for touchdowns at the goal line, or you know what? He can pick up a 15-yard carry in the middle of the field and get that yep. first down for the Colts and keep that offense on the field. And that's something that's so undervalued for fantasy because even if he only gets 30 to 40 yards rushing per game, uh, that's a great year at the end of the year from from a fantasy standpoint. Oh yeah, it's phenomenal. That's actually three or four points a game. Yeah, it, it really is the difference between being a, a decent quarterback and a great quarterback. And that's, I think, the difference that we're getting with Andrew Luck here. We're continuing to see the rushing yardage, the the rushing touchdowns potential as well. Uh, but then he's also increasing that passing number uh, with, you know, he's completing passes to everybody on the field. He's not locking in on any one receiver, which has kind of made things a little bit frustrating to own his receivers. But, I mean, for him, he has just been an absolute beast. Love him going forward. And I think that he's kind of the exact opposite of what we've, we're seeing in a guy like Cam Newton because yeah. Cam Newton right now is looking absolutely horrible. Another fellow first round or first overall pick. But I mean, you look at a guy like Cam Newton and you're seeing Andrew Luck progress and get better as a player. I'm seeing the opposite with Cam Newton. This guy looks like he's like deer in the headlights at this point. The offense looks completely horrible with him on the field. Is Cam Newton still somebody that you trust to start from a fantasy standpoint on a week to week basis? You know, any any Patriots fan or, or Tom Brady sympathizer or anyone like that that wants to bitch about offensive line, go watch a Panthers game, and you will see the worst <laughs> offensive line in football. Like, Brady has no idea how good he has it compared to what yeah. Cam has. Yeah. That dude, he's playing behind a college-level offensive line, and not like a bad college-level offensive line. They are terrible. Right. They're giving him no time. So, like, just that alone, it's hard for me to trust him. I, I still think if they have the same offensive line they had from last year, Jordan Gross, those kind of guys that left and retired and whatever else happened, injuries but I, I still I still think behind a good offensive line I'd like Cam Newton so maybe next year I'd still I'll probably be one of those guys I'll be higher on him than most but for this year speaking just specifically on that going forward it's it's tough to find some positives about him because he's just looked terrible the offensive and line looks terrible they can't run the ball they're just a, the defense looks like shit too now so and the big thing that's a concern to me is that it doesn't just look like he's having trouble passing, but we talked about this going into the year with the, the injury Injuries. concerns that he had. Yeah. I mean, he is not running the ball no, at all. I mean, him. he's putting up, he's putting up like what, not even uh, Aaron Rodgers like numbers, like Drew Brees like numbers running the ball. Running. Like, yeah. I mean, really like not even relevant at all, not getting any points on yeah. the ground, I mean, has... no rushing touchdowns, no anything. I mean, it's looked absolutely brutal for him from a fantasy standpoint. And that's really made the thing that made Cam Newton the difference between him being decent to pretty good. He was oh, never yeah, was an elite rushing. quarterback other than the one year. Um, but, you know, it's you look at it now and it's like, man, I, I, if he's not getting rushing touchdowns, what is his cap for passing touchdowns? 22, 25, this year? maybe? Yeah. yeah somewhere. I mean, he was still top five last year. But no, no, no. he was running the football significantly more. Oh, yeah, no, year. absolutely. Yeah, it's all contingent on him rushing the ball. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's what is. I'm saying, though. If, if he's not running the ball, his cap on touchdowns is probably oh, yeah, 22 to low. 25. They're which not is... risking the ribs. I mean, he has fractured ribs. I mean, it's hard to blame yeah. him. But for fantasy perspective, it's terrible for him. So my question then becomes, I mean, you start to see guys like Ben Roethlisberger and Andy Dalton and some of these guys that we talked about. Sure. I mean, for the time being, at least until we see Cam start to turn things around, are you sitting him on the bench for some of these guys who maybe weren't drafted as starters for, that maybe are still out there on the waiver wire in, in your league? 
Yeah, I mean, if there's a guy like Eli Manning or something, or a Ben Roethlisberger, I mean, even a, maybe a Carson Palmer when he eventually comes back. Would you assume he'd come back anyways? He still has that yeah. nerve issue. But, I mean, Carson Palmer, yeah, I mean, I definitely think you'd play them at least ahead of Cam Newton for the Tom Brady, those kind of guys, definitely, for the time being, and just seeing how it plays. You know, and if Cam Newton has an explosive game, it's like, oh, man, Cam rushed for three TDs and he dropped a 40. Like, cool, but the week before they dropped a, a nine on you. So, right. I, I, I think I would. I, I'd probably play, like, the guys you mentioned, Ben Roethlisberger and then Eli Manning and some of those guys ahead of him for the short term. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, completely agreed. So let's move on to uh, another topic that I wanted to talk about was the, uh, in addition to the complete train wreck that happened for New England on Monday night, the Chiefs looked pretty good on offense. I mean, yeah. I, I I don't know how much of it had to do with the fact that they were getting the ball in good field position every drive, but That's what I, was about to say. Uh, yeah. I mean, the thing is though is I mean, you look at at the fact that Jamal and Charles touched the ball 18 times in carries and uh Niall Davis touched it 16 times with carries. You start to see that even split that we talked about potentially happening in this offense. Um, now, of course, a lot of that had to do with the fact that the Chiefs were up so many points and, and they were kind of letting Jamal and Charles sit on the bench and make sure yeah. that he doesn't get hurt or aggravate that injury. He got dehydrated too. They right. Sent him but, back to get fluids. but how much of this do you think continues? Do you think that Niall Davis still touches the ball, let's say 30 to 35% of the time in this backfield no. going forward? Or do you, I, where I, do you, where I, do you think that his value lies? Is it, it solely as a handcuff at this point? Or is he even somebody you can consider starting? No, I'm not starting Niall David unless I'm in a really, really bad spot. That offense is Jamal Charles' offense. It runs through him, and it's, there's no secret behind it. They just give the ball to Charles a ton, and they say, make plays for us, which is great for fantasy. And, mm-hmm. he's, I mean, he looked fine. It looked like the ankle wasn't even an issue with him. He was out there shifty. He was still running well. I think he had 90 yards, three TDs, two of them receiving. He was Jamal Charles, like we thought from last year. He dropped, I think, a 31, I think, in PPR. And, yeah. I, and like you said, Niall Davis, so many of his carries came in, in garbage time. He kind of hurt his knee. It looked like a little bit, but he seemed okay. And then he got dehydrated. He had to go get fluids. And then they were giving Niall Davis carries. But that game was such an anomaly. The Chiefs aren't going to be dropping 40 points a week. Oh, so. come on. <laughs> you have no faith in this Andy Reid glory offense with Alex Smith at quarterback, I see. No, no, I, I, I really don't. <laughs> but so no I, I if you own jamal charles like i would definitely be hanging on to nile davis if you still are handcuffing yeah because if, if charles goes down again nile davis is a top 10 running back without question right i think he proved that yeah absolutely I mean, he's, he's a super talented back yeah they have yeah. two really good running backs but different going, style players too yeah smash and dash i mean yeah. the thing is crazy though is nile davis he's 220 he still runs like a 4-3 he's, yeah, a really he's very quick player. yeah he's a really talented player yep I mean, he he produced like a, a rock solid RB one when uh, with there. with Lash, uh, Jamal Charles down better than guys like Lashawn McCoy, better than guys like Matt Forte. Um, yep. Not to say necessarily that if Jamal Charles went down, we would be you know trading a guy like Matt Forte for Nile Davis or anything. But um, he proved that he can put up numbers even on a team that isn't necessarily going to put up huge numbers offensively on the scoreboard. Right. So I definitely like Nile Davis. I would not be dropping him even though Jamal Charles is no, is back and looks him. healthy. Yeah, have to hang um, on to him. He remains he remains a must own guy in every league, even in an eight team league at this point. He's got to be owned in he's all the of these leagues. Handcuff. Yeah, he's the absolute yeah. premium handcuff. The number one guy. Yeah, in football. I think right now at, at, as far as handcuffs go. So let's talk about another guy who <laughs> had the opportunity and didn't do what Niall Davis did. Uh, and that is Donald Brown, who stepped in for an injured oh, Danny Woodhead, stepped in for an injured Ryan Matthews, went up against the Jacksonville Jaguars, who were the worst <laughs> elite run defense. defense in football, worst pass, the worst overall defense. They're just horrible across the yeah, board. Okay. Terrible. Um, now Donald Brown didn't put up a completely terrible game, but he put up a disappointing game. And it it, it's, it, when I say, when I say completely terrible, it wasn't LaShawn McCoy numbers. I mean, he had what, you know, a, 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 an okay, he, he didn't put a, he didn't drop a zero on you, yeah. but he did. He was very, very disappointing. And the other thing too, is that he was also splitting carries with Brandon Oliver. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, this situation to me is just one that I'm avoiding right now until Ryan Matthews comes back. I know we told everybody last week and we were, we were both wrong on this. We have to, we have to call ourselves out on this. Donald Brown is not worth starting right now. Um, that was the best possible matchup that That's he could have possibly That's gone up against. Have all year. Yeah. So w- what do you do? I mean, at this point, I, I still think you have to keep him rostered, right? Yeah, but, I mean, he's a starting running back. And, and Ryan Matthews, you never know. He might have a setback, too. And then it's just right. he's at least a starting running back. And there's worse you could do on a bye week or something than the San Diego starting running back. Right. But I got, I mean, a, I got a good Donald Brown stat for you here. 
Okay. Get this, Let me hear this. Yeah. Donald Brown dead last in the NFL with point forty four yards before contact per rush. And only one point five six yards after contact. Dead last in both categories. Yikes. Dead last. Yeah, he's just terrible. And they Whereas, gave him a who's, lot who's of money. number one in those numbers? You know who's funny? <laughs> same player. Same player's number one in both categories. You know who it is? Who, who's who? DeMarco Murray. Oh, my guy. Number one in yards before contact. Number one in yards after contact. Absolutely destroying so, people this year. So you see the difference. I mean, these numbers are not just like a random stat. I mean, you see that this translates oh, yeah, to, to fantasy production oh, as well. Oh, absolutely. 100% translates. Yeah. We have like the number one running back right now versus one of the worst right now. Right. So Donald Brown, like we said, really not worth owning at this point. Um, I, I mean, I, I shouldn't say not worth owning. Not worth starting. Yeah, he is worth starting. owning. Uh, but we talked a little bit here about DeMarco Murray, and I think that that's an interesting topic because there's been a lot of controversy at the top of the draft. There's been a lot of just flat-out disappointment. I mean, obviously, guys like Adrian Peterson, we kind of throw them out just because, I mean, I think Peterson Situation. would be producing fine if he was on the field, but yeah. he isn't. So uh, huge disappointment there, huge disappointment from LaShawn McCoy, huge disappointment so far, at least, from Jamal Charles, although he did have the big game on Monday night, uh, and we think that he's going to be fine going forward. Yeah. But Still love Jamal Charles. But let's let's take a situation and let's say that for whatever reason we are redrafting right now. And and this, I think, will help people understand a little bit about where we're viewing these players and the guys that you should be targeting as your top overall players in fantasy football going forward. Right. So let's say if we put ourselves into a situation that we were redrafting right now going forward from now through the remainder of the season. So we throw out what the points that we've had for the first four weeks of the year. And yep. the only thing that you get is from here through the rest of the year. I want to know, Dustin, who is your number one player going forward in fantasy football if you were redrafting? I wrote down a quick little list, just a quick top 10, and I didn't you know, I didn't super look into it, but just off the top of my head sort of thing. Okay. Number one, I, I, I mean, it has to be DeMarco Murray. It has to be the way he's looked and the way that the Cowboys are feeding him the ball. And then I have Le'Veon Bell, too. Peyton Manning's my number three. And then in the next chunk, Jamal Charles, Gio Bernard, Jimmy Graham. And then to round it out, I have LaShawn McCoy, Rashad Jennings, and Andrew Luck. But the bigger surprise is, I think, in a redraft, Julius Thomas is absolutely a top 10 pick. Yeah, I have a number 10 overall. I, I, Interesting. I couldn't see a point where you you would allow Julius Thomas to get out of the first round with how bad tight ends have been. Well, I noticed a few guys that didn't crack your list. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I, I, I agree. Uh, my my top three right now, my, I should say top four. Okay, so I've got Tamarco Murray, Le'Veon Bell, and yeah. then at number three, I take Jimmy Graham. Yeah. Uh, just because I think that there's such a massive drop off. I, I like Julius Thomas as well. Uh, I'm probably higher on Julius than you, but I, I still love Julius Thomas. He's still very clearly the tight end two for me. But I think that there's a pretty significant drop off between Jimmy Graham and him. Yeah, not to, again, not to say that Julius Thomas can't be the number two fantasy tight end, but Jimmy Graham's upside I think is 16 touchdowns and 1,200 yards, whereas I think Julius, I think Julius Thomas's is. are like probably like 12 to 13 touchdowns and 900 yards, I think which could, is still... I think he could still get 1,000. See, I think he I, could. I, I could see like 11 to 1,200 yards. And I, I, I agree with your TD total, though. He, I mean, the thing is to me is I think it's it's more realistic for Jimmy Graham, right? Oh, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, Jimmy Graham is firmly the number one. I just think that I think it's I think it's There Jimmy is a Graham, huge drop-off still. And then everybody else. Right. That's I, agreed. Agreed. If we were tiering it, how I would tier it is Jimmy Graham is the first tier. Julius yeah. Thomas is his own second tier. And then everybody so else. I know yeah. that's rare. We don't really see that a lot in fantasy football where we have one guy. I, we sometimes see it with guys like Kelvin Johnson with, as like the sole number one guy at, at the tier of wide receiver or like a Peyton Manning as the sole number one quarterback. But it's rare that we're going to see one space, two space, and then everybody else, right? And that's what I think we see here at tight end. So I can definitely sympathize with have, having Julius Thomas in your top 10. I don't know if he would quite crack my top 10, but he's certainly right up there, at least at the in the second round, yeah. uh, or if, you know, at, at maybe somewhere between 10 to 12. But I think a, a couple other guys, uh, did you mention Marshawn Lynch? No, I, I should, I think, again, off the top of my head, he'd definitely be in there. Yeah, I think yeah. Marshawn Lynch, although, you know, still for PPR, I don't think Marshawn Lynch is a rock star or anything, but, uh, I mean, he's, he, the thing is, is the guy's just going to touch the ball so much. I knew so I was much. forgetting someone, too, and that's what it'd be, yeah, I'd have, I'd probably, actually, I'd probably bump down, I'd still have Julius Thomas in the top 10, I'd probably bump down Andrew Luck, just look yeah. at this list right now in my head. But man, we still love Andrew Luck. Like, oh yeah, forward, he, like he, we he talked about. 11. Yeah, I mean, we, it, the thing is that quarterback is there's just so many guys. Yeah, exactly. um, I mean, we still love Andrew Luck though going forward. But uh, another guy, I think you know, conspicuous by his absence, Kelvin Johnson didn't make your top ten, did he? No. 
So he, I, I mean, he'd Kelvin, be right there in the first, yeah, in the second round. But that's that's the thing is, I mean, I know Calvin has looked really bad. He's got the foot injury right now. Yeah. Uh, we we're concerned about him, frankly. I mean, he's had. I mean. Uh, Matt Stafford had the best game that he's had all year this past game, and ba- Calvin Johnson basically was just there as a decoy. I mean, they pretty much admitted that after the game. That yeah, he, he was, was just there on the whole game. He was only there just so he'd be on the field and they didn't right. worry about him. Right, exactly. So, I mean, that, that that's a tough situation because if we were doing a redraft, I mean, you hate to draft injured guys. Yeah, and exactly. not that Calvin Johnson. I mean, I mean, to me, if he's healthy, I still think Calvin Johnson is very clearly the number one wide receiver. Oh yeah, without question. But, yeah. I mean, especially in a year where it, some of the top guys just haven't performed up to snuff so far. They've been injured. Uh, I mean, all of the top guys, really, other than like Des Bryant that I can think of have been injured. We've got Brandon yeah, Marshall has been injured. Demarius has been injured. A.J. Green's been injured. Um, has Julio? You know, Julio, no, Julio has not yeah, been injured Julio, that I'm been aware of. Too. Oh, yeah, he'd, Julio's he'd be been my excellent. Number two. He'd be my number two behind Calvin. So, I mean, we kind of, you kind of get the idea, though, here that, uh, you know, you don't want to necessarily uh, completely give up on guys. But, you know, the people like LaShawn McCoy right now, it's a tough situation. It really is. Uh, you start to see these lack of production in these games, and it's not just like he's getting six points. It's like one. He's getting 10 carries for 12 yards kind of production. And he's it's getting like, the carries is the thing. That's what's super concerning. It's not just right. like, well, man, they got down and eliminated from the game plan, but it'll change. Like, no, nah, he's still getting the carries. He's just not producing with them. So overall, I mean, I, I think guys like an Eddie Lacy, yeah, guys no like a LaShawn McCoy, um, you know, these guys are are guys that I think you still have to keep uh, up there, at least in your, if not at in the late redraft. first round, early second round, Eddie I Lacy think. Eddie bottom second round for me. You've been hating on Eddie Lacy I know, all the whole been time, right. and you've been right. He did score <laughs> this past week. Yeah, so but, they, were, and they that's, blew their ass out, and they finished, he finished like a lot of 10. Well, this is, this is the reason that, we, that I liked Eddie Lacy. I think some people had Eddie Lacy doing different things than I did. Uh, I, I viewed Eddie Lacy and Monty Ball very similarly, and I still do, in that they're in a very productive offense. I don't think either of them is a super talented player, though. I got a question um, for you. Yeah, go ahead. Right now, who you got going forward? Who you have ranked higher, Monty Ball, Eddie Lacy? Uh, I'm going to say Eddie Lacy, but the only reason I'm going to say Eddie Lacy is because I feel like he is more secure in getting the carries from a week to week basis yeah, I mean, because fair. we've He's seen not losing his carries anyone yeah. and, and not that i think monty ball is either but monty ball has just looked so atrocious green yeah. bay just doesn't have anybody that i even think is realistically going to take carries from him as long as he's healthy so uh, to me, I, it's it's Eddie Lacy and Monty Ball, uh, but I think they're very very close to one another. I think they're closer than they were going into the year as well. Oh, way close. I mean, yeah. I mean, Mon- Monty Ball is going in the third round in some drafts. Eddie Lacy is going top five, which I always thought was just ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, people were talking about Eddie Lacy had the highest TD upside in the whole league. Say, shut the fuck up. No, no, he, <laughs> he never did. Green Bay's offense is not Denver's offense. It's nowhere near it. That was stupid to begin with. And I, I, I'm looking through. I'm going through my head right now in these rankings. I mean, Matt Forte is still firmly ahead of him in these rankings. True, Matt Forte is a guy that I think that we missed, or yeah. at least I missed. Yeah, yeah, Julio. I mean, Calvin definitely ahead of him. Julius Thomas, no matter where you have him, I'm having all those guys way ahead of Eddie Lacy. Eddie Lacy would be bottom second round for me. I think you could make the case. Um, I, I just think there's always going to be that value for the player who is in a high powered offense that really isn't splitting carries. I mean, how high powered are they? They look like shit. Minus Chicago has an atrocious defense. That's, yeah. that's what I'm kind of concerned about. Is like, how good is really Green Bay's offense? That's the question. I mean, we've talked about that. Um, you know, I I said last week that I think Aaron Rodgers is a guy that I'm selling on, and yeah, I'll, we got some tweets from people. Yeah, we even Frank, say, fuck you. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> who you know, we're calling us out and saying, why did you tell me to trade Aaron Rodgers? Okay, here's the thing, guys. You cannot overreact on one game okay yeah. i think that aaron Rodgers is still a st- very quality starting fantasy quarterback i think quarterback. he's yeah. yeah top five maybe number six depending on you know who you have ahead of him but um you know he's he's still a very very good fantasy quarterback but the thing is is you look at how their offense is performed overall and the lack of connection that he has with anybody really outside of jordy nelson and randall cobb yeah. and it's kind of concerning yeah. so i i think that while he's still a quality re- a quarterback he 
uh, and a very good fantasy scorer, he's going to have those monster games where he just wins you games, but he's going to have those games where he puts up a complete dud, and it's it's frustrating to own that. It's yeah, really, really frustrating Jackson. to own it, yeah, especially when Jackson. you can... Right, especially when you can get somebody that's a quality player in return for him, possibly two quality players in return for a guy like Aaron Rodgers, and especially when he's coming off of a huge game like he had this past week, you, uh, you're you not really going to find a better time to trade him because he's still early in the year where people still have that, that opinion of him as being the elite quarterback that he is and that he's coming off of a big game. Yep. So it's a perfect time to trade Aaron Rodgers, and maybe he'll come out again and throw another three, four touchdowns, and we'll look stupid. But at the same time, though, I still think that going forward, yeah, his I, value is going to be lower than it is currently. I mean, no matter what, he's going to have those games. No one's saying Aaron Rodgers is a bad player. He's going to have Correct. those games like he had on Sunday. It's just a matter of how many of those games are you going to get to how many 12-point games. Or Jimmy Sprinkled, and I was like, I got 12. I could have started fucking Andy Dalton. He would have way surpassed that. Right. That's the thing. It's about his value compared to someone like Ben Roethlisberger, Andy Dalton, Eli Manning, whoever going forward. If you could get one of those guys and a guy like, you know, a, a competent running back that you feel like you can start if you need a running back or receiver, whatever the case may be, I, I don't see a reason why you wouldn't do it. Right. That's, right. that's exactly. the argument here. It's, it's comparative value to other quarterbacks. Exactly. So let's go on now and talk about some of the mailbag questions that we got this week. So if you guys have any questions for us about this weekend's games here in week five, or if you have any trade questions or anything like that that you want us to go over, make sure that you leave them in the comment section of this video. Or of course, you can always tweet them to us at Project KSL or at ClickWood TV. So the first one comes from Colton's GT on YouTube, and he has a trade question, or not? Excuse me, not a trade question. Something to do with uh, Darren Sproles. He okay. wants to know, I guess, what Darren Sproles' value is going forward. So he says the last two weeks, Trent Richardson has had more points than Darren Sproles in my standard scoring league. So again, this is not PPR. So Darren Sproles, standard. originally not as high of value. Thank you for including that, by the way, that it was standard scoring. That's Make sure you uh, include it's that. majorly Everyone important. Has a question. Say what right. league it is. So that's going to help us really analyze this better. But um, he says, I know I shouldn't drop him. So should I hang on to him for the rest of the year or just wait for another good game and then decide to trade him after another good game for a guy like an Andre Johnson or a Reggie Bush type of player? What are your thoughts on Darren Sproles going forward? Obviously, we had pretty big opinions on him after the first yeah. couple of games when he looked amazing. But he's starting to come back to the point where, eh, I don't know. Is yeah, he even startable was, in the standard scoring league? Him non PPR. He's he's always been a PPR player. I mean even right. New Orleans, he was always a PPR guy. So it correct. If you're not in PPR, his value is is capped so much lower it's not even funny. But if in, in that kind of situation, the option where you you hold on to him, you wait for him to have he plays the Cowboys, let's say or whoever, and he Absolutely. drops that thirty five on him or whoever. <laughs> he's not gonna play the Cowboys yeah. well yeah he is. Yeah he's if, not gonna wait. he's not gonna destroy the Cowboys though. Come on. Our defense looks so good. Yeah. Well, it, <laughs> I'm not buying that, by the way, guys. But it, it, you wait for that game. If he has that game, then, yeah, you can shop him around. I don't know if someone will give you an Andre Johnson or a Reggie Wayne or whoever he said, Reggie Bush for him. But mm -hmm. you could probably get something of value for him still when he has that kind of a big game because people will be drinking the Kool-Aid again. That's what I'd do. Well, let me tell you this. I mean, if if there's an owner out there that if you're in a league where somebody still views Darren Sproles as being a, a big guy a quality guy and he'll give you reggie bush right now i For mean Darren Sproles? oh yeah without yeah yeah I'm doing without i mean you gotta get reggie bush joik bell is injured right now we don't know what the situation was with that i mean is he gonna be back this weekend we really don't know it's kind of up in the air but we do know that reggie bush is touching the ball a significant amount he's getting a decent amount of touches um he's going to be the number one guy in my opinion i always said that going forward i still think that is the case Dustin is a little higher on Joyke Bell, but I think with this with this injury situation, at That's least only, for the it's for the time being. Yeah. Yeah, see, I don't think – they say he might play this week too, so I don't right. know if that's going to be that big of a deal going forward. I don't know if it necessarily will either, but I have a little bit more faith in Reggie Bush going into this game than I do your average Detroit Lions game. Yeah. So yeah. I like him going forward as well. Um, Darren Sproles, I think, like Dustin said, really has the most of his value in a PPR league. So if you can get an owner to give you somebody like a Reggie Bush, go ahead and do that. Obviously, you're asking, should I wait until he has another big game? The question is, is if he's going to have another big game, I think. Um, 
Uh, will he though? I mean, yeah. He'll you look at it. You have to look at it from a from a standard scoring league standpoint. Okay, what is it going to take for Darren Sproles to actually have a big game? Because pop okay, yards receiving again. I mean, he's already okay. done it twice this year, hasn't he? I mean, I think he can. Happen. He can do that. But you look at the, you look at it and you say. Can he realistically get another 100-yard game? Because these are like the Chris Johnson-type games. I always refer to these as Chris Johnson games because there were so many games that one year where Chris Johnson broke 2,000 yards where 80% of his yardage came off of one play. Yeah. And obviously, you still get those points, but is it sustainable going forward? And and all the Titans fans, I have friends who are big Titans fans, and they were always telling me, oh, dude, it's totally sustainable. Yeah, he's going to be able to do this every year. And it's never even come close to happening like that yeah, again. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about Darren Sproles is he has a threat to take it to the house every time he touches the ball, and it will happen. He is. He's going to have one of those games, you know, against somebody where he's going to have a big game again. It's not like I think Darren Sproles is a non-factor now or anything. Even I don't think standard. he's... I don't think he's a non-factor, but my point, though, is in a, in a PPR league, he can very easily have a big game when he gets six to seven catches for 50 yards, okay? Because that's immediately a 12-point game before the touchdown, okay? Now, when you take it and you and you put a touchdown with it, now it's a, a 17, 18-point game, right? And that's a pretty big game, but and that's for, you know, if you I, do PPR. But when you're not in PPR, you knock off those six, seven points for the receptions. Right. And then, you know, you're sitting there at a 12-point game. And I think that that's the type of game that's Darren Sproles' real ceiling. I don't see him going out there and getting 100 yards and two touchdowns. I really, really no, don't. I, I don't. I don't think he, I don't think you need that to be a big game for him, though. I think you could have 100 total yards and a TD, which and he, he's easily capable of doing that. When he has that game, try and trade him. Yeah, I mean, if he does have that coming up, obviously, I think that's the time to trade him. In a standard scoring league, I would be waiting for any opportunity to trade him for a guy who is more prone to get you consistent points in a standard scoring league. I think that's the major point that we're trying to make here. Yeah. Uh, Darren Sproles in a PPR, significantly more value than he has in a non-PPR. Yeah, so let's move on and talk about a trade question that was asked to us on Twitter. And this came from Beakboy333 on Twitter. He wants to know, uh, he's in a half point per reception league. So 0.5 points per catch. And what he wants to know is, should I give up Le'Veon Bell, Roddy White, and Jason Witten to receive LaShawn McCoy, Alshon Jeffrey, and Greg Olson? Now, this is a classic buy low, sell high, right? Or is it? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, to, to an extent. I mean, because obviously LaShawn McCoy and Alshon Jeffrey have underperformed. Le'Veon Bell, you could say, has certainly exceeded expectations, but I think they're sustainable going forward. So it I do too. I so I mean yeah I mean obviously you're buying Lashawn McCoy and Alshon Jeffrey at their lowest point. And if you look at it in terms of upgrades, the best player in that trade is Le'Veon Bell. The second best player is Lashawn McCoy, but he's getting an upgrade with with over Roddy White. He's getting a slight upgrade with Greg Olson, but it, I I don't know. You're giving up the best player in that trade in Le'Veon Bell, and you're to- completely banking on Lashawn McCoy turning it around. Right. So if, if that doesn't happen, then you're shit out of luck, and you trade away the best player in the league or in the draft. So. I'm probably hanging on to the side because there's only Jason Witten's a good, a good tight end. Roddy White and Alshon Jeffrey. Alshon Jeffrey's underperformed this year, and I, Le'Veon Bell is the best player in the trade. I'm, I'm probably t- still hanging on to the Le'Veon Bell side of it. I think so too uh, because I think that Jason Witten is going to actually continue to improve from here. The Cowboys' offense overall has looked really bad, but what's nice is that the Cowboys have proven that they could run the ball over the first few weeks of the season just better than any other team in the league. And what that's going to do for them is it's going to force defenses to start focusing on the running game. And that's going to leave things open for Jason Witten over the middle of the field because those linebackers are going to be stepping up. They're going to be trying to stop DeMarco Murray and Jason Witten's going to hit him for 12, 15 yards. And I think that that's something that really is going to improve Jason Witten's numbers. So far, he hasn't even been a startable tight end. I don't foresee that being the the case going forward. I like him about as much as I like Greg Olson. I don't really see a major difference between the two of them. So let's wash those guys out. Alshon Jeffrey and Roddy White, I'm actually saying that I think that they're about a wash as well. Really? I don't think that, I don't, I mean, Alshon Jeffrey has a way higher potential uh, I mean, I don't think there's any question about that, but the fact of the matter is, is that he's been so banged up and he just hasn't been, he's not the apple of Jay Cutler's eyes. <laughs> you know yeah, what I'm saying? Both, Marshall, both, both these guys are Martellus the wide receiver really too. too. What was that? I said Martellus Bennett has really exceeded expectations too, but I don't think that's going to sustain. True. So, I mean, to me, they're both the wide receiver two in their offense, which is they're both their offenses are pass first. So I think it's closer to being a wash than I think a lot of people would like to admit, because I think Alshon Jeffrey is going to take a slight. If we were redrafting right now, Alshon Jeffrey drops a few spots and I think Roddy White raises a few spots. So I think that puts them 
roughly in the same range. Um, I mean, obviously, you're moving up guys like your Jordy Nelsons and, the, and those guys that were probably drafted between these two guys. So there's yeah. a little bit of a different uh, way that it's broken down. But personally, I liked Roddy White coming into the year. I think that he's performed at a decent level. Um, and I, I blanked th- versus Minnesota. The thing Josh Robinson eliminated him from that game. True. True, but there's going to be those games with every receiver. So, to me, it's not that big of a deal. I I think Roddy White is going to be a solid wide receiver, too, going forward. And I think Elshon Jeffrey is a low-end one, high-end two. So, what I'm trying to say is I think that both these guys are roughly the same value. But I do see a fairly significant difference right now between Le'Veon Bell and Sean McCoy. Yeah, I like Le'Veon, Le'Veon Bell. the best player in that trade. Right. I think Le'Veon Bell is right now is the number two overall player like we'd already talked about. And LaShawn McCoy is a borderline first round pick. So that's something to think about, because if you were going into the year, you have to think about what you would have done if you had, uh, you know, all things, all things being equal. Adrian Peterson, not suspended. Adrian Peterson is your number two overall player. Let's say, okay, are you trading him for a guy who is down there at like 10? Like, you know, a. um, trying to think of who was even down there at 10, like uh, uh, DeMarco what, Murray the before year? the season started. Because like you have to keep him. Yeah, yeah. Marsh, there's a good example. Yeah. Are you trading Adrian? Do you think that Adrian Peterson and Marshawn Lynch are essentially a wash? Because I don't. There's a huge difference between the top end of the first round and the bottom end of the first round. And I understand, obviously, it's panned out differently. But you have to view things as they currently are. And right now, Le'Veon Bell, quite a bit more valuable than LaShawn McCoy. So I am not doing this trade if I'm Beak Boy 333. Yep, I agree with that. All right, so let's move on and talk about our buy low and sell high candidates for the week because I think that there are quite a few of them. We're each going to give you one, and then I'll name off a couple of guys that I think potentially are, you know, we're not going to go in depth onto them, but a couple of guys who you could be thinking about. So my buy low for this week is wide receiver for the Buffalo Bills, Sammy Watkins, rookie wide receiver. He is an absolute beast. EJ Manuel is sitting on the bench now for Kyle Orton in Buffalo. I don't necessarily think that adds a ton of value for Sammy Watkins, but I do think that it's just, it's going to be so much harder for him. It's going to be so much, I should say, it would be almost impossible for him to be worse than he currently has been, uh, Sammy Watkins. Uh, Because not that he has been bad by any means, but EJ Manuel has been overthrowing him and just playing absolutely terrible. Yeah, so EJ I think fucking terrible. So it's hard to if, say it won't get a little, at least a little bit better. Right. If we can get somebody who's just going to be moderately competent, like I think Kyle Orton will be, I, I don't see how Sammy Watkins' numbers don't go up from here. Yeah. No, I I agree with that. I I, I like Sammy Watkins. I, I I think that Buffalo is a whole. I mean, it's how bad New England looks. I think that division is wide open, and Buffalo is a very good defense. And if they can, you know, limit mistakes, you know, get the ball in Sammy's hands, run the ball. I don't see any reason why they can't be a better team going forward. So, yeah, I think I think uh, Sammy Watkins you probably get for nothing right now, too, next to nothing. Who is your buy low for this week? I got um, the guy that was my sleeper of the week, actually, last week, was Eddie Royal, who turned out real well, dropped a 27 in PPR, two TDs, destroyed Jacksonville. So, and right now he's the number 10 receiver in PPR, Eddie Royal. Is. So he's your buy low? No, he's my sell. Oh, no, <laughs> it's the buy low, derp. No, that's all right. Go ahead, though. Who is your buy low this week? We'll we'll talk about sell high in just a moment here, and and we've already given the spoiler on who your sell high is. But yeah, who's your who's that. your buy low? It's uh, I got Niall Davis. Okay. Because I mean, we we sort of talked about the Chiefs running back situation earlier, and it's it, I, I, we we both talked about how Niall Davis would be so good going forward. And now mm-hmm. that Charles is back, and he's you know he's going out there, he's doing really well. You know, if if there is another injury to Jamal Charles, Niall Davis immediately steps in. He's a top ten running back every single week. True. And right now, he's only people are only going to value him as a handcuff. So again, right, you could right. probably spin the guy who has him, as, provided it doesn't ha- he doesn't also own Jamal Charles. But even then, he still might be willing to deal. And you can spin, get Niall Davis, and just sit him on your bench. He's a stash guy, but he's the best stash guy you can have in fantasy football for this year. Completely agreed. With Jamal Charles coming back, people are going to view him as basically being untouchable. Uh, you know, somebody that you don't even care about, a throwaway player. He might yeah. even get dropped in some leagues. Yeah. If he gets dropped in your league, you're out there using your number one waiver wire on him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, without question. Yeah, Dial Davis is the number one stash. All right, so you you already spoiled it yeah, for yourself, well, but who is your sell high for this week? Who Eddie is it, Royal. Dustin? Yeah, it's Eddie Royal. Okay. He was my sleeper of the week last week. That worked out pretty well for me. Yep. Um, uh, for the same things we talked about, or I already talked about a little bit, he's the number 10 receiver right now in PPR. He's a top 10 receiver week four, Eddie Royal. 
he's still the most tar- or no I, I think actually I think I know he's at least still he very well still might be the most targeted player in San Diego if not he's second mm-hmm. to Keenan Allen but I think he is still first and they've shown that they're going to get him the ball but the thing is is we look at this case last year Eddie Royal started off very hot last year too mm-hmm. he started off I think with very similar numbers very similar games and then he fell off and caught like one duty the rest of the year or something like that Sure. So I think he's the prime sell high. I mean, his value was, is never going to be higher than his right now. He's a top 10 receiver, Eddie Royal. And even if you can get him, if you could trade Eddie Royal and a, another player, maybe get a guy like Jeremy Macklin or something, I'm doing it every day. I'm doing it without question. Oh, yeah. Jeremy Macklin, yeah. Mike Wallace, any of those kind of guys, where you can get yourself just an upgrade. Or if you need a running back, whatever the case may be, Eddie Royal on, by himself or Eddie Royal and package him with a, somebody else to get an upgrade somewhere else, I think he's a very, very good sell high for this week. I agree. I, I think, yeah, the the big thing is you got to package him. I don't think there are going to be a lot of fantasy owners out there that are wanting to trade guys that have also been productive for a guy like Eddie Royal. But yeah, I mean, if you're if you're looking at somebody in their tough, they're in a tough situation at running back, and you can give them even just like a, a moderately okay player. Like, I mean, if you can if you can give them Donald Brown and Eddie Royal, and you can upgrade at a wide receiver, yeah, I would Brown. absolutely <laughs> do that right now. I don't know yeah. if there's going to be a ton of people that are willing to do that, but people might look at the situation and say, okay, at least he's a starting running back and uh eddie royal's been producing really well maybe so maybe like it's a matt not a... or something you can get like a yeah decent, not enough upgrade. yeah exactly guys like that that have been uh you know doing decent enough but you know they're they're in a they're in a situation where we don't view them as being like a top 10 guy going forward you package yeah. them with eddie royal and you get an upgrade at wide receiver to a guy that's probably going to be a little bit more reliable like you said like a jeremy macklin like um i think a guy like a roddy white might be a guy that you yeah want to roddy White's as well. good example yeah i like so that my sell high for this week is a running back who I've been such a big fan of his, and I think he's a future Hall of Famer, Frank Gore, okay? Look, I understand. He is still the guy in San Francisco. I get that, right? But I think people are overvaluing what his real role is on that team. Their offense played pretty bad. Kaepernick's terrible. Yeah, he's they just looked, bad again this year. They looked real bad in a game that they won. Uh, in a game that their defense didn't allow any points in. They barely won that game over Philadelphia, okay? And I think a lot of it comes back to the fact that they're not getting consistent, high-quality production out of their running back position. And I understand, Frank Gore, still the starter. I get it. But I think that he's the kind of guy who is not going to put up monster games, okay? He's not going to win you games, your fantasy game, from a week-to-week basis, But people still view him as being a top 12 to top 15 running back. And I don't see that. I get that he's going to get the consistent touches. But I think that trails off towards the end of the year here. I think Carlos Hyde is going to touch the ball more going forward than he has so far. And it's going to continue to to get to be closer to a 50 to 50 split by the end of the season. Especially if they decide that if they're on the roll toward making the playoffs. I think that they start to bench uh, Frank Gore a little bit early in games and let Carlos keep Hyde get more keep carries. Him early. Yeah, keep just him early, keep him fresh. We've seen that happen in the past with these teams. Um, it, it's not just a one player type of a thing where it's just Frank Gore that this is going to happen with, but teams will do that with their veteran running backs toward the end of the year because they want to have them healthy for the playoffs. And that's yeah. what San Francisco's end goal is. They want to win the Super Bowl this year. And if in order for them to do that, they need Frank Gore to be healthy for the playoffs. I think he's a guy that you have to start considering selling high on while he still has enough value and he's not just putting up 60 yards a game because that's about what I expect to see from him for the remainder of the season. Yeah. I mean, I, you, you make the case. I mean, I, I don't I still like Frank Gore. I mean, the thing is, is I think people overvalue his TD upside like per, quite a bit, which I think is how you get people to his TD like, upside about that. eight. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are still thinking that he's like a 15, 16 type of TD score. And that's just not yeah. the case at all. So, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. And, yeah, I mean, and PPR wise, get. he's not what he used to be. There were a couple years in there where Frank Gore was one of the elite PPR receiver, uh, wide receiver type running backs when who Austin would catch passes. Huh? When yeah, no, ex- quarterback. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's a good point because it, it is a completely different offense now than it used to be. And Frank Gore doesn't catch passes. He's yeah. not on the level of like a an Alfred Morris so where that Alfred doesn't Morris. catch passes. But yeah. he's, you know, he's about what Marshawn Lynch is, which yeah. is essentially not worth talking about from a uh, from a receiving standpoint. So I think my my personal opinion is is that especially in a PPR league you got to start selling high on Frank Gore before people start to realize just how little he is doing out there for that team. Yeah. So 
let's talk a little bit about some players that you can maybe even consider dropping right now because we're going to go into our waiver wire rankings here in a moment. But before we do that, there are a ton of guys out there right now that are being owned in fantasy leagues that there's absolutely no reason for you to continue to own these guys. Okay, people. I want to start to name off a couple of players, and Dustin, I want you to stop me when you think there's one of these players on this list who is Legion worth to. continuing to own okay. <laughs> in fan, in your standard 12-team fantasy football league, okay? okay? Number one, and these aren't in any specific order, but they're just guys that I that I have listed. All right, Danny Amendola, 88% of leagues. Yeah, should never even drafted. Fuck that guy. <laughs> D'Angelo Williams owned in 94% of leagues. Maurice Jones-Drew, 91% of leagues. Sean Green, 95% of leagues. And keep in mind, guys, Sean Green going into this year and up until this point has been the starting running back for the Tennessee Titans. I'm still saying drop him. Yeah, see, I, it, it depends who else you have on your team, but I, I can of see course. the case for dropping Sean Green. But at worst, he's still starting right now. The and upside isn't there. more carries. No, I mean, but yeah, but for bye week fill-ins, I mean, you could do worse than Sean Green for running back. Bishop Sankey did out-carry him this week. Did he? How much? Yes. What was the split? I don't remember what it was off the top of my head, but I know it was. I, I think it was at least two to one. Two to one. Yeah. So, um, I okay, mean, so maybe they finally going... are just giving the the better running back more carries. What an idea! Right. Exactly. And and not that we love Bishop Sankey. This is a bad offense. No, but Bishop I think Sankey Bishop too. Sankey is a guy that has to be started to. If for whatever reason he was dropped in your league, probably want to look at picking him up. But he's still owned in like ninety percent of leagues, so that's not really. Yeah, he's a certainly better waiver wire guy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another guy who was uh, by a lot of people considered to be a potential guy like Carlos Hyde to step in and take over the starting running back position on a team is Devonta Freeman for the Atlanta Falcons. I yeah, think that no. he's droppable. Anton yeah, Smith is flat out better than him right now. Jacoby uh, Rogers is still going to see some carries too. Yeah, and if right. Steven Jackson goes down, running back by committee shit show. I want none of them. So. Some other guys, Torrey Smith owned in 95% of leagues. He did uh, score a touchdown this past le- week, but yeah, I have no on interest. Smith. I'm still Are hanging you? on Torrey Smith. Yeah. If I you still believe think, in Tory, I mean, you look at his numbers last year. He, he, those numbers just didn't happen. He had a really good season last year. I shouldn't say really, but a pretty good, uh, definitely a fantasy football roster worth season. Sure. And I think that I mean it, we're, we're four weeks in. I think he's still going to be a starting. I mean, still he's not losing his starting gig to anybody in Baltimore. Sure, but he's very clearly the wide receiver two at best there. Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly Steve Smith has established himself as a go-to guy for now. But I think Pitt's injury, I, I think, will maybe help him going forward as they're seeing more targets. I, I yep. still hang on to Torrey Smith just to see. Agreed. I, I mean, I can see that, but it, it all depends on your your size of your league and your situation. But to me, there are so many guys on our waiver wire list here that I would drop for Torrey Smith in a heartbeat. Yeah, I mean, so, that's fair looking at what I have too. I mean. Yeah, so let's let's move on. I got Jarrett Boykin. I think he's still being owned in like 17% yeah, of leagues. No, drop him. Down. Pierre yeah. Thomas is another one that I think is really interesting. I, I know there's still this, this love for Pierre Thomas. I, at this point, am writing him off. I, w- I was wrong. Uh, I apologize to everybody who I had uh, told Pierre Thomas could potentially lead the league in receptions at running back again this year. Saints He's not going to do that. Saints looks bad. Yeah, that's the thing. It just doesn't look like we expect the Saints offense to look as a whole. So if they're not they're, scoring a shitload of points, his value is pretty minimal anyway. So, I mean, yeah. They've been pretty awful. Uh, Riley Cooper is another one. I know you love everybody in this Philadelphia offense. Well, I, I don't love but, Riley Cooper, but again, he's a starting receiver in a very good offense. It's gonna go. It's gonna score a lot of points. He's only starting forward. based on the fact that they put three receivers on the field so often, though. He still he still has a job above Jordan Matthews, though. He does, but do you like him better than Jordan Matthews going forward? Going forward, I don't know. But how many how many TDs did Cooper have last year? Didn't he have like eleven or something like that? He had a big year, but the problem is, is that since week ten of last year, he hasn't even had seventy five yards receiving in a game. Yeah, I mean, I we're mean, going to be lot, coming up on I, what eight eight games now, half a season where the guy isn't even rosterable. Really, I well, mean, seventy five yards remember, is mediocre. I remember last year a lot of his. He had those couple games. I know he had the one versus Oakland where it seemed like he scored whatever it was. Like I think he had three TDs in one game. Yeah. And he had like three in another game versus like Green Bay or something. I remember those games. So I mean, yeah, maybe he is just kind of that like big guy. But I still, I still think unless you are just absolutely you need roster spots, I'm still probably going to hang on to Riley Cooper for at least a few more weeks and see what happens with him because I still like the situation. I hate Riley Cooper because I will never start him. This is a classic case. If he, if he case. turns it around, though, you might, though, is look, the thing. Like, what if look, Jeremy Macklin gets hurt? If Jeremy Macklin gets hurt, then we're talking about a completely different situation. We have to go based on what we currently see. Well, I know, and I don't, it, see, I don't see Riley Cooper being a guy that I could ever 
go into a week and look at it and be like, oh man, I got Riley Cooper in my league. I'm, I'm feel pretty okay about that. For the time being, you're not no. starting him, but I still think going forward as situations change, which they do. We've seen all the time in the NFL, things just change. I'm going to, I'm going to name off our receivers on our, on my waiver wire rankings. And I want you to tell me which one you would rather have Riley Cooper over. Okay. Because if, if there aren't any, then I don't think you can say that Riley it, Cooper's it, the guy you want to It's so different for every scenario, though. Like, it just depends what you're in and far as it's what true. you need at it's wide true. receiver and who you have on your team. I mean, it's not so, like, player A over player B, you know? Because it's just it's different. True. It's true. Uh, Justin Hunter, another guy who I think is uh, droppable yeah, at this point. Justin another guy that I completely missed on. Yeah, fuck I, I mean, you have to you have to own your misses. You have to hype up yourself. And you point to sell to point to yourself. Me, me, me. When I do get it right, but when you get it wrong, you have to be able to go out there and admit it. I got it completely wrong with Justin Hunter coming into the year. I was looking at him as being a guy who could potentially be a big play target for the Tennessee Titans. He still has it a is ton not. Of I mean, that's he the has thing. he has the skills, but their offense is completely that's horrendous. The yeah. They have no quarterback situation at all to speak of. I mean, everybody just looks completely horrible there. Yeah. Um, Kendall Wright isn't doing what Kendall Wright normally does, so he, the defenses aren't keying in on him like I thought they would. Delaney yeah. Walker is flat out the most fantasy the relevant fantasy player, player on, that, on that team. Yeah. So I mean, that's disgusting as it is. That's just the 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 current situation that we're in. Last guy on my list of potential drop-worthy players, and this is a guy that we talked about right away today, and I, I it, it kills me to say it, but to me, Tom Brady right now is borderline ownable in fantasy football. He's certainly not startable. No. Um, obviously, he's the kind of guy that can turn it around, and we've seen him do it many, many times. He, he looks bad, and then he comes out and just drops a monster game, but the problem with him is that I don't really see that forthcoming. I really don't. I, I look at the schedule. I don't really see any cakewalk games for him. Um, he, he's seen, we've seen that when he goes up in these cakewalk games against Oakland, against a defense like Kansas City that's looked horrible, and he looks completely lost out there. Again, yeah. another guy just like Riley Cooper at this point that I cannot foresee myself feeling confident in uh, in any matchup. Yeah, you Brady, name I the matchup. On. Yeah, the thing is, is like we. It's always how oh, many is Oakland this week? You know, he's the Chiefs this week. He has. It's not. Dude, he's just not good. No matter who he's playing, he's just not a fantasy quarter. He's not a fantasy startable quarterback. Yeah, startable fantasy quarterback right now. He's just not. <laughs> right. And, and I mean, unless you're in a two QB league, I just I don't have a whole lot of interest in him. There's a lot of other guys that I think I would be much more excited about. We'll name a couple of them here in a few moments. Um, but that's gonna so those are the type of guys that we're looking at as players that you should be potentially considering dropping. Now, waiver wire guys. I, I have a, a long list here of guys. I'm gonna name off 10. Um, and, and then I'm going to give you a couple of guys who I think you could potentially look at in your real, real deep leagues. But uh, number one and number two on my list this week are both tight ends. And the reason for it is because the tight end position this year, we came into the year, a lot of us thought that the tight end position would be deeper than it is. And it turns out that guys like Jason Witten and uh, you know some of these other type of guys that have traditionally been pretty good fantasy tight ends have basically been completely worthless. Yeah. Now, when we see guys like Larry Donnell and Travis Kelsey out there leading their teams down the field, being the team's top targets, that's something we have to really look at. I think that both of those guys are my number one and number two waiver wire transition acquisitions for this week. What are your thoughts on those two tight ends? Do you believe that those guys are both must owns in every single league? Yeah, at this I mean, point? He, I mean, I've been hyping up Travis Kelsey since preseason, and just people the the measurables he has, you know, just his physicality. He's a good tight end. Yep. And and Larry Donnell, like you said, I, I like him. I, I think he's he's my number one this week too. Number two is yep. I have Kelsey three. Number two, I actually have Eli mm -hmm. because we talked about some of the quarterbacks just not being good this year. I think he's definitely sure. a good spot in fill in there. Four, I have Eddie Royal. He's still about there in way too many leagues. Yep. And he's only owned in 29% of leagues right yeah, now. that needs to change. And, he, needs, uh, he needs to be rostered in 100%. Just, just to let you guys know, and then what I'm going off of here is ESPN standard scoring going into this previous game. So, um, you know, it's going to change, obviously. These numbers are going to go up with your waiver wire acquisitions this week, and all these guys pretty much should be in the 80s or above. But... You know, these are the guys that you want to look at. So Larry Donnell only owned in 27% of leagues, Travis Kelsey, 37% of leagues, Eddie Royal, 29, and then Eli Manning, 43. So who's you, the next guy on your list that you have? After that, I have um, Lorenzo Talaferro, who I, okay. I, there's, a little, there's a little bit to be said about him. I think that it's just, I, I think that if there is going to be a lead dog that emerges from that backfield, I think it's going to be him. Okay. I, they, I think they've, they're not putting any stock in Bernard Pierce. They scratch him from the game. Justin Forsett is Justin Forsett, and actually right now Justin Forsett is actually tied with um, 
uh, oh, oh, Lamar Miller actually for yards of 20 plus yards or runs of 20 plus yards this season too. So interesting. Yeah. So I don't think that's sustainable because he's Justin Forsett. So I think if, if a lead <laughs> dog does emerge, I think it's Lorenzo Talaferro. So I like him. I do too. I, I disagree a little bit on your ranking of him though. Um, yeah, see, I, I know because it's just it's just so many running backs have been so bad that if I have a shot to get a guy who could be a lead dog, I think it's at least worth the risk. I and get it. I think he's the only running back on this list, period, for me, actually. I'm looking on, I know I also have Jarek McKinnon. Jarek McKinnon is the guy that I have ranked above him, and Jarek McKinnon is only owned in 1% of leagues. Telefaro currently owned in about 15% I, I just, of leagues. I, I don't think McKinnon has any legit shot to just take over that backfield, though. I'm going to tell you, I think by the end of the season that he's getting the the bigger share of the carries. But and I also is, think he's the relevant is that though in the Vikings. Though? I think he's, I think he's more skilled than Matt Asiata. Oh, I agree. So, but I think Asiata is much safer. I mean, and he's a much a, a guy built for a bigger workload. You know? True, but I want to I want to also point out that Jarek McKinnon had 18 carries for 135 yards. This past yeah. week, no, he, I mean, yeah. that's he's getting a ton of touches, and that's in a game when uh, Matt Asiata scored three touchdowns. So it's not like he's just like, you know, not just randomly getting yards no, for I, whatever I think reason. He'll see carries week two. I just don't think that he's gonna have. I don't think he's gonna have hundred yards and eighteen carries every single week. And I just don't think he overtakes Asiata. My personal opinion with Jarek McKinnon, and I've heard this because I live in Minnesota, and all that I hear is. Vikings, stories Vikings, about the Vikings, Vikings, Vikings all Vikings. the time. So <laughs> I've, I've heard this from quite a few experts and people that are close to the situation. The only reason that Jarek McKinnon isn't the lead dog there right now is because of pass protection. And they've got young, they've got a young quarterback with Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, they had a bad quarterback situation to begin with to start the season. And, and they Teddy needed a guy. Good. Yeah, Teddy looked good, but they need a guy that can step up and per, per, uh, protect the quarterback position because their offensive line isn't yeah, spectacular. Is clearly way better than so, that, so, right, and that's the thing is Jarek McKinnon, once he starts to improve a little bit in pass protection, and really the only way you can do that is being by being on the field because in a, in a practice situation, they're not going to let your quarterback get hit. So it's really hard to really get a real grasp of how good somebody is right. in practice. And that's why I think that Jarek McKinnon – Given how many carries he was uh, given this past week, I think that it's a real. There's a real possibility that he is the number one guy in that offense going forward, and I like that a lot better than I do the likely three-headed monster that we've got in Baltimore. Although I do still think Telefair needs to be owned in most leagues. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, and then I, after that, I have James Jones, who's done a lot better than I think people realize as far as James Jones. Putting up. Only owned in 52% of leagues still. Yeah. Uh, clearly still the number one guy there, although he didn't lead the team in targets this past week, but still um, still he's, the top the, guy he's there He's the for top sure. receiver in Oakland. I mean, right. it's Oakland. Take that for whatever you want, but it's clearly his job to lose. And then Correct. Brian Quick after that, and then yep. um, uh, then I have McKinnon. Like you have, I have McKinnon at eight. Then Marcus okay. Wheaton. Yep. And then I have Teddy Bridgewater at 10 because, again, yeah, we talked about how many bad quarterbacks. And then... Just one guy that I didn't that I have at eleven, but I felt like I was trying to find a spot for him the whole way down the list is Jarris Wright. Yeah, he, actually, I had him way down on my list too. Yeah, yeah he's going to be one I of had the, him owned in fewer was, than one percent of leagues right yeah, now. Yeah, he was far and away Teddy Bridgewater's favorite guy. I mean, Cordell Patterson right. didn't even feel like he didn't even see the ball the whole game. Yeah. They didn't even, even I, looking for him. And I've been down on Patterson, and it, yeah, that's the big reason that. because I think Jarris Wright is arguably a better player than than Cordell Patterson. Yeah. I know that sounds ridiculous, but um, I look at I look at Cordero Patterson as being a Devin Hester like player, and I don't think that that is a consistent thing. I don't believe that he is going to be a guy that ever is out there catching ten passes a game. And I think Jarris Wright could very well develop into that. He's in his third year. He's a kind of guy that uh, North Turner is really high on him. So I mean, you think the right. snaps are going to come for him? He'll be on the field at least. And, and Teddy Bridgewater, he was his favorite guy to throw to. So and Teddy Bridgewater's not losing his job. So. Exactly. So we definitely like to see that. And that's something that gets overlooked a lot too, is when a new quarterback comes in, these guys have been playing primarily with backups in practice and they start to develop this chemistry with their guys in practice who they, you they know, trust. they may not be throwing to Cordero Patterson and they yeah. might not be throwing to, to, uh, uh, Greg Jennings. They're throwing to guys like Jarius Wright in, in practice. So you get that connection with these guys. You start to talk with them on a, on a week to week basis. And you start to see guys like that develop into being decent fantasy players just because of that sole thing. 
So that's your top 10. Uh, another guy that I wanted to add in there, Ruben Randall is still only owned in 53% of leagues. God, I so think crazy. that's pretty only criminal. Only yeah, that's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> he should be on all the leagues. Uh, he pretty much needs to be owned in every league at this point. Uh, Victor Cruz is still the wide receiver one there, but Ruben Randall has a, a ton of talent, and the, I think the New York Giants offense is going to continue to improve. Um, they're not going to you know, put up monster numbers every single week, but they're not going to be as bad as they were through the majority of the season. So, or the majority of the start of the season, I should say. So. Yeah. With that being said, guys, that is pretty much going to wrap things up for us today. We want to thank you guys for tuning in. I know it was a longer episode than normal, but we had a lot to talk about, and I really hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope that you learned something. If you did, make sure you press that like button below, and also be sure to press the subscribe button so that you can be updated when we put out our next episode. If you guys have any questions about your lineup for next weekend's games, or if you're thinking about making a trade, or if you just have any general fantasy football questions, make sure to leave those in the comment section below, or of course, tweet them to us at ClickwithTV or at Project KSL. And while you're on Twitter, send Project KSL a follow, and uh, make sure to uh, ask him some questions. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> we do appreciate it. Um, and of course, like I said, we'll make sure to answer your questions on the next episode if we like the question. With that being said, guys, that is going to wrap it up. Thank you again for tuning in, and we will have our preview for Week 5 later this week on the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.